just going to start. We've done this before, by the way. We had two previous space panels around the time of the Biocom meeting, but this is the first time we've done it in this environment. So we wanted to get out of our own comfort zone and come to a place where it's all about art and science coming together. Uh, so Twyman, um, we've done quite a few experiments together yes. with our lab, also with Alison <coughs> Motri's lab. Uh, what has been the take home message for you in terms of developing technology for space and its applications on the ground? Yeah, so I think the, the interesting thing, you know, for Space Tango and, and working with both of you all is taking the core of what you're trying to do, automating it, and what we really tell our team is to really see around corners because we have delayed launches. You're, you've got a science experiment that is in every orientation imaginable. It goes from 1G one, one to 4Gs to 0 to 4 to 1. Uh, it needs to survive that. The science needs to survive that. Um, so that's one of the big things is, is, is being able to take the, the things that your, your team does and um, uh, the work that's done up, this, uh, up the road there and implement that in a, in a space supply chain is the way we say it. And, you know, uh, Dr. Jamieson, you kind of opened about bringing science and art together. Um, uh, you know, Allison, I, I think will remember this. We actually held a precursor to Space Tango actually held a seminar like this about eight years ago in this very room, which is, I think, where we met. So um, it, it actually brings these two together. Um, it, it's kind of odd. And I had not put that together until walking back into oh, this room amazing. about 30 minutes ago. Deja vu. So, yes. So. And can you tell us a little bit more about the Cube Lab and the AI algorithms? Because Rhea may want to know. Yeah, absolutely. There's several ways you can approach uh, research in space. And so there's the conversation between manual and automated, um, uh, distributed, um, architectures and things like that. And what we, Space Tango, tries to do is really take the whole lab and put it in one box so that it can fit in different spacecraft. Um, uh, it, can, it can operate within, uh, on the launch vehicle, on the space station, uh, items like that. So we literally seal up the box on Earth. Um, it goes to the space station. We almost think of, this, of the ISS or a, a Dragon spacecraft as a utility. It's providing power and data to, to, to us. Um, and we're able to communicate with it the entire time. We gather all that telemetry so that we can take that. We can do it with a ground control so we can compare um, the temperatures, the humidities, and obviously uh, the gravitational fields. Uh, we use AI part particularly on your work, Dr. Jameson, because we're taking thousands of images a day. And so we're looking for cells. We want to track where the cells go across the bag of the bioreactors uh, systems that we have for you. So uh, we, we've used a lot of AI uh, over, the, over the four missions we've done with you and added more every mission. Right. And I, I'm going to put you on the spot still a little bit more. So we worked on hematopoietic sure. stem cells derived from aged normal bone marrow donors who were generous enough to donate their bone marrow. Allison's worked on brain organoids, and we'll show some data later. Uh, but, Al you know, we've got Tatiana here working on liver and David. Mm -hmm. And then we've also got Dr. Borak, who works on AT2 cells in the lung and has other... Uh, methods to yep. look at lung aging. Is that something that you could look at as well in your cube lab, or what are your thoughts? So a absolutely. Yeah. For us, what we want to break it down to is what is kind of the bio bioreactor. Is it wells? Is it bags? Um, are they adherent? Are they, are they in suspension? And so um, we found that we can, at, uh, even the bioreactors we developed with you, um, mm -hmm. use those for the liver work that we're talking about and others. So um, we've not found science we can't fit from a uh, from a biological perspective. We have found physical science stuff, um, like combustion is quite hard to do in a cube lab. So uh, <laughs> the biological, we're OK. So. I can imagine. Yes. And then we've got our friend Ken Shield. So I've got to tell you a story. So there was a CIRM grant. I don't know, Maria, if you remember this. But it was a CIRM grant application for doing experiments in space. And so we thought, we better apply for this. I contact Ken Shields. And he said, of course we can do this together. So I thought, what a nice team. We got to the end of the road. We wrote the grant. And then CIRM said, nah, you can't get the payload back. We don't think we really want to fund these. And Ken said, I've had to put up with her for writing this thing. Wait a minute. <laughs> So anyway, Ken, has, we've been trying to find a way to keep working with Ken. And a lot of us went to Sierra Space, and it was very exciting. So we had Allison and David and Tatiana and Sheldon and I and Sandra uh, and yeah. Michelle and T. Denny Sanford coming with us to Sierra Space because we thought this could be historic as a collaboration. Now, you've got a special launch coming up. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about what Sierra Space is developing 
Certainly, yeah. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank you, Dr. Jameson, for the opportunity. Kat, and, uh, please, I feel like I'm in trouble with both of you. Been a, to, probably uh, Rhea. Yeah. Is that the name, Rhea? Rhea, R-I-A. you got to be nice to Rhea. She's kind of <laughs> scary looking. But um, yes, Kat, thank you. We at Sierra Space, we have a, uh, a new technology for uh, providing transportation and logistics services to low Earth orbit, in, in our case, specifically in near term to the International Space Station. It's uh, essentially a winged space plane that we call the Dream Chaser. And it's been in development for over a decade, about 10 years. It's a long time coming. Uh, and the entire industry, really the entire community on a global uh, perspective is, is looking forward to having this capability because it offers certain uh, services, certain capabilities that don't exist today. Uh, the space plane, uh, I'm sure most of you, uh, I hope, are familiar with the space shuttle uh, that we had uh, years ago. Very sim similar concept of operations in that it launches on top of a, uh, a rocket, uh, goes to the International Space Station, delivers cargo, delivers research payloads, uh, ice cream, uh, chicken tenders, whatever it is that those guys, <laughs> Uber Eats. Mm -hmm. uh, after we finish with the delivery, uh, the space station releases it, comes back down. Now what's different with our Dream Chaser space plane than the capsules that, that we're using today? Very low G reentry through the atmosphere, about one and a half Gs. You can imagine what that might mean for a very precious cargo, very precious research, maybe CGMP uh, type implications there, which that's what we're looking for, right? We're looking to put those services and those capabilities in place to have a line of sight to enabling that kind of activity. And then the next part that's a real differentiator is once it comes through the atmosphere, it lands like a glider. Uh, and we can land on a runway that can accommodate uh, really a 737 is, is what we uh, compare it to. Uh, around the world, and, and we are working now to put um, landing licenses in place in different, different areas around the globe. We've got uh, a couple across the United States, Midwest, West Coast. Uh, we're also working with the uh, United Kingdom. Um, we're working with people in the uh, Middle East, uh, Europe, uh, several different areas. Not for a stunt to land a space plane and take some awesome pictures, which that's fun, that's a bonus, but to help generate and build those ecosystems around this new space tech that we're all developing, right? You hear Space Tango, Casus, um, Axiom. Uh, we're all working very hard with industry and academia and different government agencies, not only from the United States, but around the world, to build this, what we call at Sierra Space, the orbital age. And, and to us, the orbital age means we're at the forefront of the next industrial revolution, and we believe quite confidently that a major portion of that is gonna come from the space tech. Uh, in, in many of the topics and disciplines that we're talking today, but also in many others that span outside the life sciences into many other realms. And, and we're prospecting in all those areas. And one more thing, Kat, I want to say about your comments ab ab about hosting a unique event here where we're bringing together non-traditional audiences that don't often interact. Um, we think this is a terrific uh, approach, and, and it's certainly one of the things that we're doing from a space company perspective as we're building these new applications and these new businesses in space, not space stations, we're building new businesses in space, we've got to reach out and interact with different audiences where they are and, and meet them where they are and, and speak to them in a language that they understand. So I love what I call crea uh, uh, generating these creative collisions with, with new, new audiences and, and folks that don't usually talk. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that interaction later as we uh, walk around and get to know each other a little bit, maybe answer more of your questions. Uh, so that's the ultimate Uber, Uber Eats. Uber Eats. Uber, Uber Eats. Uber Eats. Uber Eats. <laughs> so when you're developing API, active pharmaceutical ingredient, Magda and Francois want to make a new drug. Um, Alex Kalesi, the head of our brain tumor program, just came in. How could you do that in space? What are the advantages of working in space? And how would your API hubs or your new landing hubs help with the distribution of those new products? Well, as I, as I said there in that opening soliloquy, uh, it enables all of those activities in new global regions that never had the access. Nice. Suddenly, you have a direct connection. You have a space node where you're doing some of this uh, production, and then you have the, the terrestrial node, I'm going to call it, that maybe exists in areas that didn't exist before because now you have the direct link, the direct connection that we didn't have before. And, and with the system that we're bringing, uh, you've got very quick retrieval, um, instead of the capsule landing in an ocean or somewhere out on a, uh, you know, a, a desert and, and you, you got to take 24 or 48 hours or 60 plus hours in a pretty rugged environment where frankly you can't predict what 
is going to be happening to those payloads? What's going to be happening to that product? Let's think of it like that. Let's forget the space vernacular. What's happening to the product that you just produced in space? You need to control it, right? It's about tight care, custody, and control, and quick retrieval. Uh, one thing I didn't mention with the Dream Chaser, after it lands, it's hot, right? came through the atmosphere, it's about 3,000 degrees, but within about 30 to 45 minutes, it's to a safe level where we're retrieving that product. And we're retrieving that product directly to the facility that's going to distribute that product, potentially. Uh, that's how we're, we're looking at it. The Dream Chaser, um, if you would, follow our website. We've got a lot of information about it. Right now, we're slated to start service to the ISS in June of this year. Uh, we've got a lot of smart people. Uh, I love Twyman's phrase there. I'm going to steal it. Trying to look around those corners to make sure we don't have uh, any last-minute hiccups with software or things of that nature as we start to get very close to becoming operational. So I wanted to get to Janice Sudemeyer because she was there with Jack-Jack for Ellison's original launch and actually wrote the first grant with us with, um, with Space Tango, Integrated Space Temsel Orbital Research Lab. I score because I grew up in Canada, so it's got to be about hockey. Uh, Chris and I had to watch Hockey Night in Canada too much. Anyway, Janice got the most energy of anybody other than Rhea. So, uh, Jana. <laughs> When you're helping us with all these experiments that Peggy makes work, thank you, Peggy. Uh, Peggy Woodson, our astronaut here, who is a commander. What do you think the most impactful discoveries have been, and how do you envision that, considering you're on the National Academies, uh, how do you see this a year, maybe even 10 years from now? Well, first, thanks for the invitation and congratulations on the amazing success. One year anniversary of the Astrobiotechnology Hub is nothing compared to the distance that we've all gone together to get here. And I'm just so pleased to see the amazing progress that you and the team continue to make. But when I think about the science and what the future looks like, even the decadal is a good reference, Kat, because you know we're really kind of changing from, this is the decade of results. So we've done research on station for the last 20 plus years. But what we've learned from the research that we've done has helped us to really be able to get to those points where we can start to make breakthroughs and think about doing things like manufacturing in space. So we'll have vehicles that will help us to take things back and forth, modules that will be attached that will actually give us GMP facilities on orbit. These things I don't think we could have thought about, but they're all enabled by the science. And if we didn't have that science that was helping us to understand where those breakthroughs are, and Ken, just to let you know, we decided Dream Chaser should land at Miramar because we need our payloads back really yes, quick. Yes, please. Add private. it to the list. <laughs> Start from working the, the paperwork. It takes a while. Paperwork. Missions, right? But that's another piece that I think, from the science perspective, we've tried to leverage every component of even the private astronaut missions to expand that science, ask questions in a way that we have repetitive experiments that we can get results from that allow us to really direct that research and continue for it to grow. So, Jen, I was wondering, you're building the first fully independent space station uh, that will attach to the International Space Station, then become fully autonomous. What do you think the advantages are to drug development, cellular therapeutics, you know, protein crystallization? Can you tell us a little bit more about that, what we can do in space with you? Sure. Well, I often say it's very hard to think about taking gravity out of the equation because it's in everything that we do. So today, you can't imagine being in a weightless environment or what it would look like. When the biology changes and the physical forces change, our opportunity to not only create products in space that we can't create here on Earth, but find breakthroughs because we can see the science so differently. And so I think, Kat, as we think about you know, the opportunity for what the future looks like, I'm going to steal a phrase from our president, Matt Onler, who often says, 10 years from now, we're going to be sitting with a lot of healthcare and technology products around us that we couldn't have imagined, but we can't imagine how we're going to live without, and a lot of those will be coming from space. So Velcro is one thing, and I'll, I'll let uh, <laughs> Mike Roberts talk about that at the end. But um, so, Jana. You know, how did you envision the collaborative framework here? You've been in biotech, you've been in the space industry. I mean, really, you're the inspiration for a lot of what we're doing right now. How did you think that we could all do this? <laughs> so when I met Allison and we first started talking about brain organoids in microgravity, 
The reason I transitioned from biotech, pharma, and medical devices, I heard the word innovation way too many times, and it just didn't really seem innovative. And we weren't, there were challenges that we were facing that we really couldn't get past on a lot of really difficult diseases to solve. Autism, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, cancer. And so when I first met Allison, and I just thought, I love the way he thinks because he's able to think outside the box. Then I had the opportunity to meet Kat, and I thought, this is the team. Because if we're gonna do this anywhere, this is the, the team that really has that vision. And what's so fun for me is, in addition to the science that we achieve <coughs> through our missions in microgravity, I get to watch really brilliant scientists rethink the way that they're even asking the questions of their research. To me, that's where I knew that this collaboration, we had to just continue. And as we thought about the initial I-score concepts, how we can expand beyond that. I mean, I think we say this often, and it's Kat's phrase, and the sky is no longer the limit for us. And so as we think about how we can help patients through a new approach, looking at science through a new lens and with new tools. I don't know that people think of microgravity as a tool, but it really is when it comes to science. And it's a new way for us to be able to define opportunities for patients that are in need. Thanks very much, Jen. And we'll, have, we'll go around and have everybody in the audience ask questions because you'll hear my voice too much tonight. <laughs> uh, speaking of patient advocates, I just wanted Sandra to say uh, anything that comes to mind <laughs> about why it matters to get new solutions for tough diseases on Earth. Sure. Um, so I am a, a patient of cats, and I have a very rare form of um, sort of blood bone marrow cancer. And early on when I got my diagnosis, there weren't really any treatment options. I've been a patient of cats now for over a decade. Um, and every one of those 10 years, I have existed because of Kat and her team's dedication to finding you know, new ways to keep me going, to keep me healthy, not just alive. And um, I have perpetually turned to Kat and said, you know, um, I, you know, I, I need you, I need your help. And Kat has said, we will find a way. We will, I will never give up, we will find a way. And so it's so exciting to be sitting here in this room knowing that Kat has the confidence that I have in Kat because of the team that she is surrounded by, that we will never give up in these new discoveries. And I love your point about the decade of results that now is the time when patients like me will really begin to benefit from all of this amazing innovation and work that you all are doing. Like, how exciting is it to be in this room right now? <laughs> well, you know, you can see how strong Sandra is. And when we're doing experiments with intrepid scientists like Peggy Whitson, and we have an aha moment. Wow, Peggy just found this. Jana, look at this. <laughs> Pinar, look at this. Jessica, this is for Sandra. This is for other people in the room who desperately need new solutions, or at least a back pocket solution, just in case something happens. This is for all of us. One in three of us will be diagnosed with cancer at some point in our lives. Every single one of us will be directly connected with somebody who has cancer. Rhea can't get cancer, as far as I know, Shuba. <laughs> Uh, but she's going to hear a lot about it. So this is part of our Cancer Moonshot strategy. Um, we have the brightest and the best here in this room. And we've all got to do this together. So thank you, Sandra, for being here. Um, we were at a California Institute for Regenerative Medicine event on genomics. And Craig Venter was giving a talk on why we need to look at our all of our DNA sequences to say, are we at risk for cancer or other diseases we could never have imagined? And then I gave a little talk, and then Sandra gave a talk. And Casey was there, Sandra's husband. Uh, they weren't married at the time, but Sandra gave such a compelling reason for why we need to do this. It's for all of us. Sandra was the poster child, literally, for the last prop. So we, we have a lot to thank you for, Sandra. Uh, but it's, it, every time I'm feeling like this is impossible, I turn to Sandra. I turn Please to you. Please help me. <laughs> <laughs> help us. So help us all help each other. So moving on to our friend for the Center for Advancement of Science in Space, Mike Roberts, uh, who literally never gives up. 
and has been doing this for a number of years. I think I said 23 years. It's a little while. Um, but Mike, I'm going to ask you the, the tougher questions because it's fun. <laughs> anyway. <Good. laughs> right. Um, so what is the biggest milestone that you think um, for ISS that you've achieved over the last year, not last two decades, but was there something momentous in the last year or that you foresee in the next year or a couple of years where you think, wow, I could never have imagined this? Uh, well, first of all, let me begin by uh, thanking you. It's an honor to be in the room. So one of the major accomplishments of uh, what we've been able to do on the International Space Station in cooperation with NASA has been to create communities like this that have begun to explore the value of space, not just for the benefit of human exploration, but expanding it to better understand how that access to space is improving lives here on Earth. So to bring that back home a little bit and, and really try to answer the question, we've seen over the past several years during this decade of results, not only significant scientific discoveries, We've seen through the efforts of communities like that here in UC San Diego and the efforts of the entire state of California and focusing on stem cell research, the translation of those discoveries into patients affecting real world outcomes. So sitting here looking out at the ocean, I'm thinking about just how vast and far that ocean is and we are just at the edge of discovery. The International Space Station has been a wonderful tool for NASA and the international partners. It is now a tool that is available to broader communities from the commercial and private sector who are expanding the capabilities on board the International Space Station every day. So among the discoveries I would like to mention is you know, through the efforts of Space Tango, Axiom Space, Sierra Space, lots of others, we are seeing new discoveries and new platforms come online every year. One of the most uh, startling discoveries to me in the life sciences has been in the areas of the utility of microgravity research for exploring models to better understand the onset of progression of human disease. So for a long time, we've engaged in research that has focused on understanding the human response to space environments so that we could go farther into space and spend longer times there. But over the, the last few years, we've seen that starting to translate into real discoveries here on Earth, which again, are starting to move into clinical testing. We're seeing applications from large pharmaceutical companies and a number of small startup companies that had never thought about access to space as being important to their pace of discovery. But they now, now are moving into that realm. We are seeing engagement from a multitude of other US government agencies, National Institutes of Health, National Science Foundation, who are putting significant funding, in addition to the funding that NASA will continue to put into space, to continue to develop new facilities and explore new possibilities in that arena. So the centers of research excellence like you have here are critical to that. Um, we need to have discoveries that uh, are regionalized and developed with communities of interest, and the most promising of those that can benefit from access to space continue to grow and take advantage of new platforms as they come online in space. Many of you, I hope, are aware just last week, um, a company called Varda had sent to space uh, a dedicated facility for the manufacture of a new drug for the treatment of AIDS. So they are looking at a long-standing area of research. They, like other companies before them, are starting to look at ways to commercialize that and make it more economical. So through the efforts of companies like Axiom Space, um, Varda, Vast, Sierra Space, we're going to see new opportunities for researchers to utilize the space environment to make new, to make new drugs, to make drugs more effective that already exist in our, our armament, and more importantly, to design tests that can give us quicker answers about the safety and efficacy of these drugs against systems such as the organoid systems and tissue chips that are developed here. So when you have Merck and BMS, two very big rival companies working together, how did you get that happening on the International Space Station where they resolved the crystal structure of pembrolizumab binding to PD-1? How did these awkward collaborations happen? And uh, you know, I know that you can get unusual people to work together, yeah. <laughs> but how did it, that happen? It helps to have NASA as a partner. 
Uh, NASA has been working with some of these companies for a long period of time, and NASA is a, has a significant interest in maintaining access to low Earth orbit, even though NASA's ambitions and goals are going farther beyond that. Um, as a scientist, I would say one of the most important benefits of that is start the conversation with the science folks and not the lawyers uh -huh. in the room. <laughs> you need to bring them into the conversation, but later is better than, than earlier. And a lot of it is focused on shared benefit. Uh, there is benefit across the, the community of uh, manufacturers who are involved in active, in, in active pharmaceutical ingredients, APIs to understand that there are significant advantages to the manufacturer using different processes that are benefited by the absence of gravity. So a lot of it was focused just on the fundamental understanding, what can I learn from this environment that will improve the crystalline form of the API in my frontline drug? And how can I then grow, use that knowledge to improve manufacturing processes in the future? Along the way, they also, lit on, also learned about opportunities to test those APIs in the space environment using these accelerated models, whether they were based on rodent research models or now more prominently based on organoids and other things. So a lot of the discussion, the initial discussion, was based around scientific curiosity and shared benefits so that there weren't <coughs> concerns about um, intellectual property generation and the prior to that. As we move forward, there will be opportunities to also have more significant engagement from those who are concerned about their intellectual property generation because they will be able to work with the commercial sector who is going to be better able to offer them capabilities, facilities, and protection as they move forward. All right, so um, you've heard these erudite comments, and we just wanted to open it up for everyone. We've got uh, the until recent CEO of CIRM, who's here, Maria Milan, no pressure, Maria. Just in case you have any questions, she and I were attendings at Stanford together, and uh, she's a constant patient advocate and scientist. I have wondered if you had any specific questions, Maria. This panel's been incredibly um, compelling, and some of these comments have already opened up a lot of, you know, possibilities. Um, I think that the comment that struck me the most is reimagining how science is done and how questions are asked, because that's true. I mean, that is something that didn't really strike me till today in terms of the application to solutions on Earth. So, uh, thank you for today, because we we hear components of it and it's sometimes just that one kernel you know really kind of drives home what the potential opportunities are thank you so much thank you maria actually i just wanted to for peggy so peggy woodson we have to give peggy a round of applause hey, please, please stand uh, Peggy Whitson was a commander of Axiom 2 and has done i think the most spacewalks of any nasa astronaut is that correct uh, I've tied. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Longest time in space. Yeah, my question to you, because we wanted you on the panel, but you're on the next one. You can't be on every panel. <laughs> Why do you do this? Because when we're watching you floating around back to Velcro, you Velcroed everything, discovered in space, Mike Roberts <laughs> told me. Why would you want to be in that tortuous environment where it's so constricting and, but, you know, we're making these exciting discoveries. What compels you to do that? Um, the idea of exploration has always just been something uh, that w motivated me, you know, from when I was nine and watched the first guys walk on the moon. Also, I was a Trekkie before that, and I thought <laughs> I wanted to be something between Captain Kirk and Doc Mr. Spock, you know. I wanted to be <laughs> the scientist and the commander. So, hey, I actually made it. <laughs> You've been both. <laughs> but I love, I love being the hands of all the science. Um, the scientists on the ground, I've done hundreds of different types of research, physical sciences, life sciences, all of it is just really a lot, a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, my first flight was in 2002. And over the time frame uh, till now, the research that we're doing is so amazing now. It is just uh, e exponentially grown over that time, the quality and caliber of the science we're doing. And so I'm really excited about um, all the work that we're doing on the cancer cells, the stem cells, um, because my experience is life sciences, and so that I'm kind of interested in that in particular. But all of it's a lot of fun. And being able to do different kinds of research on any given day uh, is 
just amazing to see all the different differences in what gravity or the lack of gravity offers as a tool. Right. And then you first discovered that the stem cells or the cells you were working with seemed to be expanding or proliferating in space, didn't you? Yeah, we, they were growing so quickly that I, uh, when I pulled them out after a few days of incubation, I thought they were contaminated. I was crushed. <laughs> I was, you know, I'd done cell culture on the ground and I knew sterile technique and I thought, oh my gosh, I've contaminated. <laughs> and then, I, but it was like, like one well, which didn't make sense. And then we pulled out another plate and it was the same well. And so it was the same type of cell that was proliferating so quickly. And mm -hmm. uh, so it's just really exciting, the discoveries that, that we've found in space. Um, and I'm excited about where the future <coughs> is headed because now we need to start manufacturing. We need to start utilizing it and producing products uh, that we can use here on the ground. Yeah, thank you. And Arun, you've done experiments in space. I'm going to put Arun Sharma because he was working on IPS derived everything. Uh, you've worked with Joe Wu, you've worked with uh, Clive Spencer, and of course Jana and the Axiom team. Can you tell us a little bit more about, did you find the same thing as Peggy? Were you seeing stem cell proliferation in space? Yeah, so Peggy was also working on our project as well. Thank you, Peggy. Um, we saw something similar where the formation of organoids, these small three-dimensional clusters of cells, was really facilitated by the presence of microgravity uh, at a rate that was, you know, very impressive, something that happened within hours. So, you know, I think there's a lot of results that are confirmed that are being illustrated by just the, the presence of low gravity that are, uh, it's, it's a really exciting time from the perspective of a researcher to be involved with this. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the head of neurosurgery and the Neurosur Neurosurgical Society in the U.S. City right next to you. Um, Dr. Kalesi, what do you think about all this? Is it pie in the sky or is this going to be helpful to you as a neurosurgeon? No, well, well, first of all, I, I just want to congratulate the panel and Kat on what I think is a great discussion. And, and I'm not a rocket scientist, so the fact that I'm here <laughs> tells you that there's got to be uh, something really interesting. And when you heard the kind of diseases that are being studied by, by this sort of opportunity in space, they really um, all bear on, on my practice in a day-to-day -day way. There's so much that we have left to do in neurodevelopmental and neurodegenerative conditions and to identify therapeutic targets for stereotactic delivery of a biologic or a payload. And I think some of those discoveries are going to happen in space. And, and uh, the discussion around cancer stem cells, it used to be as a neurosurgeon, two-thirds of the craniotomies we did for tumor were for intrinsic brain tumors, where we still have a lot of opportunities. But now that, that uh, ratio has flipped to looking at brain metastases. And so when we think across the spectrum of cancer, um, our systemic treatments of cancer have improved to the point now that as a neurosurgeon, the biology of those individual cancers is actually quite relevant to my practice because it's now meaningful um, uh, to intervene on those patients. And, and Kat and I, among others, have been doing a lot of tissue work around uh, breast cancer metastases, for example, to the brain. And so I, I think a lot of what we see in, in uh, the space uh, laboratories of the future are going to ultimately uh, deliver therapies that will bear very strongly on the practice of neurosurgery. Thank you. So we have Dr. Borog here, and I just love to put her on the spot because she's running the biggest department, I think, on campus. It's 700 faculty members or something crazy. Um, did you have questions, Dr. Borak? Dr. Borak, uh, make sure that we do the science we need to do to be rigorous, reliable, reproducible. What are your thoughts, or do you have questions for the panel? You do this to me every time. I do, because it's fun. <laughs> so I should stop showing up. <laughs> No, I think it's, it's yeah. terrific, and you actually um, intrigued me when you first started to tell me about this, and I've heard you speak about it. I think it's amazing to see the effects of microgravity or zero gravity on, on these cells. I wonder, and, and I may be asking a question that goes way back, and it's my ignorance, but what led you all to believe that there would be these effects? It's, <laughs> it's interesting to see that there are effects, but who came up with the notion that there would be, and then I have some practical questions about how I actually do it <laughs> to see if I could consider sending the cells that we work on, which, right. you know, one of the, I work on primary cells, so those are a lot more difficult to mm -hmm. keep for a period of time in culture. So just wondering, practically speaking, you know, is this bioreactor just goes there mm -hmm. and it stays there, or do you actually intervene and feed the cells and things like that? So practically, how does it work? Yes and yes. Uh, <laughs> so we'll let Allison answer, or not Allison, um, sorry, Twyman. Uh, the bioreactor, yes, you can put primary cells for doing aged bone marrow. Um, did you want to comment on that? Well, I think, you know, who, who thought of it? I mean, they've been doing studies for, you know, I, I assume almost since, since human space flight started. I think a little bit from a philosophical level, there are four fundamental forces of the universe, uh, the strong, weak nuclear force, electromagnetism, and gravity. And every 
time humanity has been able to push or change one of those, we've been able to create technology and build the world around us. Uh, electromagnetism is a great example of uh, many things, but wireless communications is one. So, you know, being able to, to modulate gravity is, is going to create some change. Um, and, and I think building the infrastructure of the space flight and, and the astronauts and some of the work that we do gives you that, that infrastructure to probe where is it valuable. Um, and, and, and that's kind of what we're talking about here. So, you know, I think it started, I think, as human spaceflight started, but I think as it's become more abundant, as automation, as, you know, things have gotten more um, processing power, other things like that, technologies build on top of each other, which creates the acceleration. And, and now that we've got a space station that's been there several years, um, we're able to, to, to look into these different areas. So that kind of gives the philosophical and a little bit of the technologies building on one another. So do you anticipate it being able to go to more complex models? Because these are... I, I think mean, it's inevitable. Uh, I think, you know, with the services that some of the people, you know, other uh, colleagues on, on the panel, um, uh, you're definitely going to be able to get, you know, whether it's larger tissue structures, organs, you know, um, other items like that. I, I know it's all in all of our minds. Um, you know, accomplishing it will take some time. But, you know, it, yes, it's an inevitability. I had a question for Meg, just while we're on this topic. Uh, we've got Rhea here on purpose because we're thinking, is it, right to send people to space if we're doing these iterative missions with Sierra Space, Axiom Space um, cases, how do we measure the, you know, the potential detrimental effects to humans? Should we be sending Rhea up instead of <laughs> intrepid scientists? Meg, what are your thoughts about how we keep people safe and how do we develop programs for this? Great question and thank you for putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> So for those of you that don't know, my background is in human research um, before I was the deputy scientist for the ISS program. So one of the things that we is at utmost priority is keeping our crew safe and healthy. And so we have a lot of systems on board ISS that do that and monitor the crew and make sure that they're safe during flight and that they land safely. And one of the things um, as we approach this new era of space flight, whether it's longer durations in low Earth orbit or to out to exploration destinations um, to the lunar surface is we are going to learn new things about the humans. They're gonna be exposed to new things during space flight. And so we want to understand those things on the space station in this very well controlled environment and know as much as we can know about that now and similarly, we're gonna learn more as we go towards exploration. So we wanna enable a lot of science in exploration. We wanna get really good at it now, and we wanna take those capabilities, whether it's hardware or engineering or really smart scientists like we have in the room right now, and continue that work in an exploration era. So the more we know, the safer we're going to be able to make spacecraft in the space environment and um, the countermeasures that keep humans healthy as we go. So this is the type of research that we need to know. We need to start digging into the things that are the unknown and the unobvious and um, really work towards that innovative work that you all are doing. So speaking of the less obvious, Davide, do you see innovative strategies that we've missed that we're not even thinking about? Are you, I mean, you're a stem cell biologist. And you know, when, we're, when you're surrounded by stem cell biologists, you gotta do a plug. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again for <laughs> putting me on the spot. Um, yeah, um, innovations out there. Um, yeah, one of the main things is to, to understand like how metastatic process works. Right. That would be really um, beneficial to us um, to understand and you know to intervene. And on the neurodegenerative side as well, like mm -hmm. how can we um, block those processes? They have also some commonalities. Um, yeah, mainly those two. Yeah. So I'll ask the same question to John Rask and Sita at the back as their uh, constant partners. John Rask is at NASA and he's always following up to say, what have we done lately? Is it interesting? Oh, is this getting more interesting or is no, it just getting derivative? What no, do you this think? is great. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'm just sort of struck of how profound this moment is in terms of our awareness as a species. Uh, in the cosmos of what we're learning from space. The future of uh, life on Earth is starting here uh, and has been going on in this, in this arena. And uh, I, 
it, the information that we're learning is very privileged. Not everybody in the world understands this and sees this. And so what I'm envisioning is that there is uh, much more throughput. Uh, the idea of landing payloads nearby here. Yeah. Let's let's make this a routine phenomenon, not just once every, you know, year, couple times a year. Let's do it every month, and let's do this um, in many different places all over the earth. Uh, and that gets to my question to the panel members: What don't you have now that you really need to make this kind of thing happen? Wow. We'll go first. Wow. <laughs> Enough Thank coffee. Said, wow, well, so he right, gets I'll, to answer I'll, it. I'll try, I'll try the first. Okay. Enough coffee at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Black cat coffee. Black cat coffee. Yeah. No, but those are some of the most, I, I think those are, those are some of the most amazing moments too, right? When I get to hear someone like Kat see her science and say, Christmas came early. Yeah. Or like, you know, as we, if we could have that kind of cadence, and I wasn't kidding when I said, I mean, Miramar is a big runway, right? Yeah, we land absolutely. big fighter jets here. Sure. So yeah. we could, I'm sure the Dream Chaser could fit there. Yep. And we have a couple of other runways around here as well. Sure. So for us, it's the cadence of that science, right? Being able to do that on such a regular basis that we're able to have an opportunity to push that science even faster. I mean, right now, their access to the ISS there's two vehicles that go up and only one that comes back down again. And to try to get in that chain, so that's where we try to use the private astronaut missions to help to accelerate that pace a little bit. We have more flights coming on, Sierra Nevada's Dream Chaser. Hopefully Boeing will have a Starliner that will fly. And so you're gonna start to see that the pace will pick up. That pace is gonna also accelerate our ability to do that research. Making those, it's not kind of jokes, but we used to splash down right off the coast here in Long Beach. And for everybody in California, we could get our payloads pretty quick, right? And in Florida, they're helicoptered off in four hours. So, and then they're in FedEx or someone's standing there from the team and is literally taking it back. But that, so we work around those constraints right now, but the easier that we can make it so that we can go right down the road and pick up our payload which Ken's gonna help us with. Yeah, so. absolutely. And, and to footstop on the pace a little bit, but maybe a, a, a little bit different angle on that. Um, decades ago, when, as Twyman said, when NASA first started doing biology in space, right, the technology and the hardware that they used was very specific for space exploration, and, and it was for space applications purely. Now we're moving to a point where we're putting facilities in orbit to do this work that are very similar to what researchers on the ground are working on, right? And, and I would say that, you know, that difference, the old style versus the new style, we're getting, we're getting closer, right? We're getting closer to something that a researcher is working with today in a laboratory that, that some of us got to go and tour today, which I didn't get to do that. <laughs> we, we need to pick up the pace on that technology, right? Because that's what's going to bring more of the non-traditional microgravity researchers, especially from industry, but also academia and agencies that are funding this work. That's what's gonna bring them on board because now it's a little too nascent. It's a little too unique. It's, it's interesting. The, the wonder and uniqueness of space is a huge attraction, but then when you immerse yourself in it and start to understand what it takes to operate in, the, in that environment, it starts to work against you a little bit. And so we've got to kind of meld those two together and, and make it so it's actually the uniqueness is not so unique. It's more routine. Uh, it's not quite so nascent. It's awesome. It's wondrous, but it's not very different than what I do in my laboratory down the street. And we need to pick up the pace to do that because time's burning, right? As, as Mike has indicated, the ISS has been a great test kitchen for these past 15 years, 20 years, especially the last decade where we've really picked up on the utilization. Um, but time's burning. And, and companies like Axiom and ours and, and Space Tango and many others who are plowing full speed ahead on trying to build these commercial capabilities to really open this stuff up. I mean, take a whole giant leap forward in what we can do on these platforms. We've got to use today and our ISS to pick up the pace on advancing those technologies. It's going to make it a more compelling environment to innovate, as, as Jan has been talking about. Well, and I'm going to add one more thing to that, because the other thing that we're so lucky to have Peggy Whitson, right, who's a trained biologist up there. And honestly, if you ever get a chance, Kat's got videos from the work that we've done on station, but it's like watching an orchestra to watch her work on station in a glove box. It's just stunning. But we need scientist astronauts. 
we need people who know the science too. Private astronaut missions give us the opportunity to do that now as well. So it's a whole different, you know, the core of astronauts initially were builders when we had to build the space station. Then they became scientists to work in that laboratory. Now we want the people who are the cutting edge scientists right here from this institution to have their own hands on that science up in microgravity as well. And I think that's what the future really holds. We're gonna see so many changes like that that you can't expect right now, but because of the changes that are taking place, space is no longer just run by space agencies. It's open to everyone, countries, scientists, people who want to be able to contribute and make those kind of breakthroughs. So I wanted to uh, bring you back to CETA at the back of the room and, and to talk about the supply chain logistics. How do we make space more accessible to people? Do we all have to go into space uh, because Christian is starting to give me Dramamine or something <laughs> much stronger, a Dancitron? How do we make this more accessible? So Chris sitting in front of you can do her prostate cancer research, getting back to Davide's metastatic prostate cancer question. How do we make this more accessible for those of us that aren't as lucky to work with Peggy? Uh, you know, how do we do that? No, that's a great question. Um, thank you, Kat. I think something that you've achieved today that I'm really, really inspired by is you've galvanized our industry on the space side as well as a host of researchers who are either space engaged, those of you who have already sent multiple payloads up and have secured grant funding to achieve that, or space curious, you wondering about the properties of microgravity and examine is this something that we actually want to leverage or not. One of the challenges, and I actually really love John, your question is what are the challenges to us in industry? I would probably summarize them in two words, market share and mind share. To get to that high throughput enabling capability where you could run 100 experiments in a year, to get to a logistics and supply chain so that you have a multitude of researchers whose interest is there, the curiosity is there, and maybe even the samples of induced pluripotent stem cells are just waiting by the batch. Um, if you wanna actually get to that scale, we have to have market share, meaning capital, to be able to build the larger systems. They're incredibly capital expenditure intensive. They're incredibly uh, research oriented, and there's some skepticism outside of this room about the financial and commercial viability of the platform. We all are true believers, but outside of this room, that skepticism we absolutely need to contend with. And that's why I say mindshare. It's one thing to talk about private astronaut missions and the viability of science in space because it achieves such a fundamentally profound impact for patients and the entire uh, ecosystem here. But it's another thing to say, it's going to make money, folks. And that story is the one that we all absolutely need to tell. So I would say if we can all continue to galvanize around each other as an ecosystem and promote each other's business, then market share and mind share are within reach. And I want to end with a little story. In August 2020, um, I was the head of human space flight sales, the first in SpaceX. And we had just concluded demo one. Demo two hadn't even gone up yet. And we thought, hmm, what would it take to actually create this idea of a private astronaut mission where you could have a capsule that takes scientific research payload for any citizen scientist that goes up to the International Space Station, maybe other destinations beyond there. That concept became a Space Act agreement. That became a contract that I actually sold to our dear friends at Axiom <laughs> that has turned into the missions that are AXs one through seven that has enabled the kind of scientific research that the researchers here today are performing and that leaders like Peggy Whitson have executed on. That happened in four years. That happened in four years. So if we can't galvanize to speed this process up even further, then, you know, I, I don't know what we're doing here. But, I mean, with people like you leading us, then we can only get there further and further. Speaking of galvanizing market share, Christian, um, how do you get, over, get other people over this skepticism? I mean, because we've seen it. We've watched Peggy do our experiments. We've seen what happens in the cube lab. We've been uh, plied with coffee that's from <laughs> the best coffee place in the world to do these things. How do you get this uh, message across? Because Mike's very compelling when he talks, and so is Jana, so is Ken, so is Twyman. Everybody in the room is convinced. But you've got to convince Maria Milan. You've got to convince the funders in the room, no pressure. I mean, that people that have um, been champions of industry, like Lee Stein in the back, Magda Marquet here. How do we say to our friends in biotech and high tech, this matters? 
really comes down to good quality, repeatable science, mm -hmm. and it comes down to uh, some innovative discoveries that you can hold up as a billboard to a path to the future. And I think that's really the place where we've got to focus on is you, there are a lot of different ways to do things in space, and you can do some really crappy science in space if you want to, but if you do it, <laughs> if you, if you do it the right way, the way we're, we're all doing it together here in this room, you really drive some very novel discovery, and those discoveries are what drives customers to the table and say, I want to repeat something like that. I would like to figure out how we can innovate like that. And so that's what, we're really, what we really need to try to do. Great. And then I'm going to leave it to the patient advocates in the room, Andrew, Esther, Noah, you're going to speak in the panel, but I'm going to leave it to Andrew and Esther. Why would this experiment in space matter? for patients that are dealing with draconian diseases. Esther and Andrew. Well, we're living with chronic cancer. I am, like Sandra. And so you're our hope for what's next. Now, we're clueless about what you can do in space or how it relates to the ground, but it sounds really cool. And so we're hoping all the terms. <laughs> yeah, we've been looking up organoids too. So we're, um, we're very hopeful that this will be what's next. And I think you've been talking about that, about how it's expanding so fast. And we hope the money is there. And from some of these major companies and government, we were just in Washington, D.C., and we were telling congressmen, this is happening. And we mentioned about this. And we said, you guys need to support this because we're counting on it. All right. On that note, um, sorry, one last question. I did get an A in organic chemistry, so I'm left with a question. Um, I'm concerned about heat. Heat abhors, abhors gravity. It hates gravity. Heat goes up. What happens to heat? <laughs> in your experiments. And, yeah. and partly I'm asking additionally, do you have a, uh, a virtual twin box happening down here? This is how you show the public the difference. Yes. Yeah, so every single experiment that we do in space has a twin cube lab down here. So there's always a control, but also we have a twin scientist in space. So I consider Peggy my twin in space, being the twin scientist. So basically the scientists who are in space trained to do what we do. Um, so yes, we always have a ground control that's run in the identical way. Well, you show, you show the public. This is what happens down here, but this is what happens yeah. up there. Yeah, so I know you're and an emergency room physician and it, you, know, you have to do things with a sense of urgency like you have from your training. We have the same sense of urgency. Um, one of the first paper uh, is under review at a major journal. So I think it really behooves us to publish in um, places where people can see it. The experiment that Janet was alluding to that Peggy and our team were doing uh, together at Axiom 2 and then we did with uh, Walter Villaday on Axiom 3 ended up in Fortune magazine. It has the actual data. So we're really trying to get the data out as quickly as we can. Sometimes it's a little faster than we expect. Uh, but certainly this is for the public. This is um, work that we want to make available. And we've got Bruce Steele here. Your daughter was part of these experiments, Kathleen. We're not just trying to make it public. We're trying to train the next generation of scientists that will do this and make it public. We have David Brenner, who was the vice chancellor of health sciences, who thought this was, sure, it's a good idea. Larry Goldstein, running our stem cell program, said we need to understand how stem cells work in all environments. So this is for all of us. And absolutely, it will be public. Uh, but I think that's the end of uh, this session. Mm -hmm.